All right, let's talk about geologic hazards. Most things in geology take forever, like literally millions and hundreds of millions, sometimes even billions of years to happen. Geologic events don't. These can happen suddenly, quickly, before you can even really think about it. So that's what's the big thing about them is we can't prepare for them. We don't get these large time scales and we have to figure them out kind of, you know, on the fly. So the main ones we're going to talk about in this class are earthquakes, volcanoes, and tsunamis. We don't really have any of those in North Carolina. Every now and then we'll have a tiny little earthquake, but it's not like it's a big one like California gets that we have to worry about. So what is an earthquake? Well, I'm not going to waste time explaining what the basics of an earthquake is because all of you know what an earthquake is. But we do find them near fault lines and near plate boundaries. Now you can use page 10 on your reference table to look at the plate boundaries and that's what we would have been doing if a hurricane, which is our next unit, hadn't come through and disrupted us being at school. But we're going to go through that and figure out what kind of earthquakes occur where and where we can find fault lines and what that means. Something I really need you to know is the difference between the focus and the epicenter. The focus is where all the energy is focused. It's where the actual earthquake happens. It's however deep underneath the ground, 10, 20, 70, 100, 200, 300 kilometers underneath the ground. The epicenter is the point on the surface that's directly above it. So wherever it happens, draw a line straight up. That's your epicenter. It then makes sense that that's where you feel the earthquake the most. It's the closest place on the surface to where the actual earthquake happened. We know this by measuring different seismic waves and two of those waves and the ones we're gonna talk about here are the primary and secondary waves, P waves and S waves. We know that primary waves go quicker. We know that they can go through any medium. We know that they are longitudinal waves. We know that secondary waves go slower. We know that they get there second. We know that they can't go through liquids and that those are called transverse waves. Now, you don't need to understand the physics and the math behind those things, but you do need to understand that primary waves are primary. They'll always get there first. Secondary waves are secondary. They'll always get there second. And we can tell how far away the earthquake happened from that seismic recording station based on the difference between them. If the primary and the secondary wave are really close together when they arrive, it was a pretty close earthquake to the station. If it's a really big difference in between them, then it took a longer time to travel. There was more time for it to spread out. The primary wave got there, some time goes by, the secondary wave gets there. We know the earthquake was farther away from that seismic recording station. When it gets there, we look at a couple different factors of the earthquake. We look at the magnitude, and the magnitude now is a mathematical model based on a bunch of different math and physics. I know I keep saying that, but it's everywhere in earth science along with chemistry. And we look at how much work was done by this. And when I say work, I don't mean, you know, you going to work or me working as a teacher. It's the actual physical idea of work, how much energy is released, how much movement occurs, those kind of things. And we put those on a different scales. Now, originally we used the Richter scale, but that's not the one we use anymore because we figured out after magnitude 5.0, things get a little weird with it. There's the modified Mercalli scale, which is a subjective one, which means there's no real objective scientific backing. So we don't like to use that. Science doesn't really love subjective data, if you remember back to the intro unit. The one we use now is called the modified, or sorry, the moment magnitude scale. I was thinking about that modified Mercalli scale. The moment magnitude scale. That is a mathematical representation of what happens in the earth when an earthquake occurs. It goes on a log scale which means a jump of one is not one, it's 10. So to go from a four to a five is 10 times stronger, but every jump is 10. But remember, it's a log scale, which means it's not 10 plus 10, it's 10 times 10. So to go from four to five is 10, to go to four to six is two, add two zeros onto the end of it, it's 100 times stronger. Remember that. So what else do we need to know about earthquakes? Well, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time in this video going over how to prepare for earthquakes because let's be real, 
in North Carolina, we're probably not going to need to know it. But the basics are, and if you ever travel somewhere that has them, you're going to try to find um, somewhere safe underneath the table, underneath a desk, underneath something like that, so nothing can drop from the ceiling and hit you. That's where most damage and where most people actually get hurt. It's not from the earthquake itself, but from things falling, air conditioner, lights, um, stuff like that, and hitting you or trapping you or collapsing on top of you. Now, of course, buildings can fail and, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen. So you got to be careful where you build them. If you have it on, say, metamorphic or igneous rock or sedimentary rock, the actual rock layer itself, you should be good to go. When you start getting into those finer grained sediments, sands, muds, silts, stuff like that, you're going to worry about liquefaction happening. And that's when the water content and the small grains shake so quickly that the ground temporarily becomes a liquid. You build a building on top of that, probably isn't going to go super well for you. Places like California and Japan have to be incredibly careful about not only what they build on, but what they build out of. If you build something out of a really rigid structure and really rigid material, it's probably going to fail at some point during an earthquake. But if you build it to be resilient, or you put these different kind of weights or flexible mechanisms in them, it'll probably be okay. What should you do? Regardless of where you're at, regardless of how strong it is, if you think you're in trouble in an earthquake, then drop, cover, and hold. It's pretty much that simple. What else? What else do we need to know about earthquakes? Why am I talking to you about earthquakes? Well, the main thing to remember, just where do they happen? That's the focus. Where's the epicenter? That's on the surface. How do we tell them? Seismic waves. What are those seismic waves? Primary, secondary. Primary can go through anything. Secondary can't go through liquid. We know the primary always gets there first. We know that the difference between the first and the second, the primary and the secondary wave, tells us roughly how far away that is. What else? Well, that's got to get to our next video where we're looking at the different layers and how that transmits earthquake waves and what that means for us when we're studying them. Hey,